Welcome to a very special edition of the ODPH podcast, better known as the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. And I do mean a special edition because when you see us, one, on Nerd Initiative YouTube, you know it's a big deal. Two, if you see we have Zoom hooked up, this is a super big deal. And three, if you see the star-studded panel we have for this, you know it's a super massive big deal. To my right, your left, from the 3FN podcast, you know him also as the co-host of 607 TWS, The Wrestling Show. Say hello to Rich. Yes. Hello, everybody. Well, welcome back to the ODPH Society and also Nerd Initiative. It's awesome. Yes. And to my left, your right, do I even try doing your intro or should I just let you go at it? Coming at you live and direct straight from a folding chair in the ODPH studios. It is I, Off the Cuff Tom. Thank you so much for having me again on Mr. Ken M. It's always a pleasure. It is a super massive pleasure. Yes, indeed. Because one year ago, a book came out that really got fans excited. It made a massive impact and gave birth to what is comics' most exciting universe. You can debate me all you want about this, but trust me, you will not win because the creativity and the characters coming out from each book in this line is absolutely phenomenal and it has revolutionized what you think about superhero comics to this day. Since that time, a lot has gone down and we've seen such great introductions of characters as Rogue Son, Inferno Girl Red, and The Dead Lucky, just to name a few. And this week, almost one year to the date, so a little couple weeks here and there, we have been granted a sequel that is of super massive proportion and is one that if you're a comic book fan, you need in your collection ASAP if you don't have it already. Now, I can sit here and show this book all day because I love this universe, but we have some friends on the line that can talk about it just a little more than I can. First off, from the incredible series Rogue Son, writer Ryan Parrott, from the, yeah. the amazing, dead lucky, Melissa Flores. Hello. From the astonishing Inferno Girl Red, Mac Broom, and from Hi everybody, the amazing, phenomenal franchise of the Massiverse, Radiant Black, and 2023's best new series, no one, Kyle Higgins. Hey, how's it going? And last but certainly not least, I've been told I need to say Supreme Editor Extraordinaire, Michael Basil. Mr. Massiverse he's... himself. Yes, Mr. Also Massiverse Also best himself. beard. Ooh. Ooh. I don't know that I like this. <laughs> <laughs> the beard looks great, Michael. I don't know why. It's, it's not the beard. beard. It's, it's, it's the rest of it. The beard is fine. Michael, <laughs> it looks like you have a God, like a Jesus light over you. <laughs> yeah, I, I, hold on. I'll turn that off. He's going to part the Red Sea any moment. No, that's better. <laughs> Look at all that glorious follicle. Yes, indeed. Well, since last time we spoke, because we have spoken, we've had the honor of speaking to you throughout the past year. Supermassive One comes out last year, gives birth to the massive verse. How have things changed since now and then? Oh, well, I, I think we, I get less sleep you, now somehow. <laughs> Um, we've confused people apparently with, um, did, did we actually call it supermassive one? I thought it was always, our intention was always that it was supermassive and then the year. So supermassive 2022 and then supermassive 2023. But I have seen there's some confusion about like numbering of supermassive one versus supermassive 2023. So, um, that's different, I guess now. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, th this time last year, there was one ongoing book, right? We had Radiant Black. Uh, now there is Radiant Black, The Dead Lucky, and Rogue Sun. There's no one. There's Radiant Pink is just wrapping up. We've had Radiant mm -hmm. Red, which wrapped up. Inferno Girl Red, book one has come out. Oh, boy. We're, we're a lot busier than we were this time last year. And there's more that we yeah we can't actually say out loud yet it's it's only been a year it feels like this this universe is aging in dog years like holy moly <laughs> it's amazing i can't that's just a lot of stuff to do in a year i i i don't know why i didn't realize it until this moment but yeah uh, good lord okay yeah you know how tired you are it's because we work a lot all that the makes time. sense yeah. yeah you know to be fair i i wasn't i remember when you guys first pitched me the title supermassive i was like lukewarm on it but then after hearing these guys intro i'm like super on board with it now so thanks guys <laughs> yeah but they could do that for anything we could have called it like the hot dog eating power hour and the, the, <laughs> they'd put the spin on it and we'd, we'd be like yeah no. <laughs> you can make that work oh absolutely but i mean it goes to the testament of the the creativity and the quality that you're doing i mean coming out of the pages of radiant black the fan base was already there and when this book came out, 
or Supermassive Volume 1 or Supermassive 2022, it really got fans talking. And I have to say, like, as a fan of superhero books, this reminds me so much of what you guys are doing of when Image first came out. Because every time there's a number one that comes out, when Rogue Sun did, when Dead Lucky did, Inferno Go Red, every time there's a number one that comes out, I go to our local comic shop and there is such a buzz and an energy and everybody is talking about it. And everybody in line is just like, just so amped up to get reading it. And then I go online and everybody is just like, everywhere you go, if you're on comics, Twitter is just raving about it and rightfully so. And just like the impact that you all have made with these characters to see it's just been a year is just truly astonishing. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, it's that. a it's a big legacy to live in, right? I think going all the way back to the starting of Image and, and the groundwork that those guys laid. And then since then, all of the incredible people that have built up the legacy of Image, all we can do is try and live up to their responsibility and um, keep taking big swings and doing cool stuff and making sure that we don't water down what it means to do truly create our own stuff. I, I actually got emotional when you said that. Like, I actually started to get a little teary. Like, I, I, I like I was 14 when Image came out. I've said this in a lot of calls, but it's true. And I, and I, that was, I was primed for Image. Like, I followed all of those creators. I followed all the original books. I bought so many of the number ones that I lost all my money. And like, I still have, and I, I mean, I bought the obscure ones, like Troll number one, Super Patriot, like that kind of stuff. <laughs> and so like, Ooh. yeah, deep cuts, right? Like those yeah. kind of words, but I like, I loved those books. And to me, the, the, the thing that I always loved about Image was that it was like really the first time that I realized that comic books, I, I was follow. I, I realized it was like a, a, a job and like did these, I loved these artists and I wanted to be like them. And so when I followed them, it was like, mate, comic books are more than the heroes at the big two. It's all the stuff that they created. And it just felt like there was this sort of like raw energy and, and excitement that came around the, every one of those books. So the fact that you're comparing our books at all to that is... I hope, man, I hope, I hope we're a quarter of ex as exciting as those books are. And like, I, and so like, that's amazing. And, and like my, Matt said, like, that's a lot of, that's a lot of weight and responsibility and uh, some big shoes to fill. So it's crazy. I, 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 this has all been kind of a dream and I can't believe we get to keep doing this. It's really weird. It's, it's pretty awesome. It's somebody that doesn't have that kind of background in comic books. I got started much later in life. You know, I don't have the the history of comic books and and, and I, I want I have the love for comic books but it wasn't born you know when I was eight years old reading comic books or 14 because I just didn't have access to those books at that time for me what really made me fall in love with this universe and continues to fall in love with the universe is is the passion uh, that I see for the storytelling from every one of these guys that I'm working with every single time like I um I fell uh platonically in love with Ryan um one time when we were at boom together and like we were trying to solve a problem and he just got so excited he jumped up like tom cruise and like almost jumped on the table because he was so, so excited about a solve and you know and that I, you I, gave I, me by the way that you gave yeah but i mean it was so, your story you know so it, yeah like, but you just skipped over the cool part which is that you fixed it <laughs> <laughs> well you know it, but it's just it's the creativity and and the passion that these guys have or like even listening you know i do a lot of work with kyle and you know we'd be I, I don't drink, um, not because I'm semi-allergic, but like we'd be at a hotel bar or an airport bar um, doing some crazy project together. And like he was just telling me about all these exciting ideas that he had. And, you know, and, and Michael and Matt, who, you know, I first only knew through their podcast, you know, I, I started reading their stuff and I just became just as a, as a producer first and then a writer, just humbled and awed by the amount of passion they have, they have for telling these stories and telling them uniquely and creatively in an interesting way. And I think it says a lot for, for me, even though I'm in this universe and I'm writing my own book, I am genuinely excited to read Rogue Sun every month and to read, read like, I kind of almost don't want to know what they're planning sometimes. Cause I'm just, I love that page turn. Like I have not asked uh, Matt what's going to happen with Inferno Girl Red because I don't, I genuinely want to read it and find out. Um, and and I think that's because we have that level, I think, of an, of infectious enthusiasm for our projects. Um, I hope it bleeds out on the page and I hope that the fans kind of can can see that love as well. Um, and I think that's part of what makes Massiverse so special. 
No, absolutely. I, I think it, it definitely resonates off the page, and especially with the one-on-one -on -one connections you have with the fans, too. I mean, to think about just the creative stuff that has come through, like the QR codes for the animated short for Radiant Black, and then you talk about right now the vote for arguably one of the biggest decisions in all the Massiverse with who will be Radiant Black will be uh, well, the obvious choice is Team Nathan, and then you know you can vote for Team Marshall if you want. But <laughs> if you want to be wrong, you can vote for Marshall. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Exactly. But giving fans that option and making your creation so vulnerable and wide open to connect with them on that level. I mean, I think that's one thing that just makes it stand out that you're giving the audience something so special with just doing things in such a ne next level thinking and connecting with on that. But if you're sitting there going like, oh, I'm so used to reading you know, this story and I got to go read X, Y and Z to get to the whole picture. You're not for, you're not doing that here. It's like you're giving self-contained series, which everybody can just read on their own. They don't need to read everything. But by the time you're done with the series, you want to read somebody else's series in the Massiverse. And connecting on that level, I think, has just been such a big win. And giving the fans really just something fresh and exciting to pick up every time at the local comic shop. I mean, that's that's the core essence of the Massiverse, in my opinion. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, we all do. Um, you know, a lot of that really comes from kind of a melting pot here where it, it was cool. Like I got to know Matt and Michael um, really just kind of coincidentally because I agreed to do a podcast interview on Ranger Danger when I started the book. And that was, I was just taking a flyer on that. And I don't, especially then I, I wasn't really doing podcasts. Like I wasn't, I was doing Power Rangers, the book, but like I hadn't had a great experience at DC and was kind of coming out of that. And I just directed a big new short film and trying to figure out how to weaponize it to get my feature going. And I was just in this place of kind of in between. And, um, you know, the Power Ranger book certainly changed things for me. Um, not only kind of like, trajectory wise, as far as the types of stuff and stories I would, I would continue to tell obviously with things like the Massiverse, but, um, but also just kind of like with helping me to fall in love with superhero stories again. Um, and Matt and Michael coming at this and explaining the fandom to me and talking about Rangers, something I loved growing up. So it was still very pure to me and to be able to come into this, which was in a lot of ways, you know, no disrespect to the show, but it was in a lot of ways, virgin snow to come in and be able to build out material in a format that um, you weren't limited by budget in the way the original show was and pre-existing footage and things like that. And so like just being able to continue to talk with these guys, what started as a monthly thing and then just continued on from there and and as a like mind talking about often wouldn't it be cool if and then in this a lot of cases they were things that i was able to then go actually try to make happen you know um the the short film that melissa i don't know if it was on this podcast or the last one melissa was talking about doing a the lord draken short film like that came out of you know i had an idea with jdf and and it was like okay well how do we actually do this you know the shattered grid live table read that was a matter michael idea yeah. and then we figure out well then how do we actually do it you know and when you're used to doing things and making things and finishing things and then you meet other people that are as committed to doing that exact thing as well the finishing things part um, and they're really good at what they do, then it just becomes, it's still a lot of work, but it becomes very fulfilling and fun because everything we're doing, we're really trying to, you know, commit to the bit for lack of a better term, um, but also take full advantage of not only the concept, but like what the state of superhero comics is. And like so much of what I love as a storyteller comes from not only superhero comics and, and the ones I loved growing up, but also all the superhero media 
and in terms of the movies and the cartoons and and things like that. And I was just talking about this a little while ago, but like I grew up, you know, the special features era of of DVD sales and and behind the scenes documentaries and viral marketing campaigns and things like that. And so when you're able to tie some of that stuff, which does or can feel like there's a little bit of magic in the world, when you can tie that to narrative, um, then you're doing something that is more encompassing. And I think that based on all the different skill sets that we all have, um, it's been cool to be able to kind of explore that those other you know, mediums and territories um, and trying to make that kind of encompassing stuff for ourselves. Absolutely. No, I mean, I, th I think it definitely comes across like that. And especially for what you've done for superhero comics now, I mean, it's just, it's so refreshing to see. And then it really, like I say, it kind of spawned from Supermassive 2022. And then, I mean, how soon after that issue did the idea of doing a sequel come about? And like the process behind that it was pretty quickly. I think we keep working out when we started talking about it, and then I keep forgetting. It was like a couple of. I I think after we did that book, we were all like, "So we're going to do another one of these, right?" And then by a couple of months later, we'd had like an official email going out that was, "Hey everyone, so let's start talking." Now, when you were figuring that out, where did that lead for each of your individual stories to be able to get to the point where, you know, uh, 2023 started at? Like, were you working your own narratives to eventually get to this point? Yeah, that was um, that was one of the big challenges with this, uh, this special was that we're all telling stories that are, uh, by and large, uh, you know, the, uh, structured in similar amount of, you know, like six issue arcs, basically. Um, so that means we all are kind of ending arcs around the same time, uh, which makes scheduling a super massive really great. But it also means that we're going to, in this case, we're all entering really interesting new status quos at roughly the same time. So that meant having though to write this story far in advance of actually writing the issues that lead into the status quo um, to give Daniela enough time um, to draw what is essentially a 50 page blockbuster. Absolutely. And speaking of that, I mean, the book is out right now. It's a phenomenal read. Can we talk a little bit about what went into this issue? Like what's the basic plot for it and who the major players are for this uh, go around for Supermassive? Sure, yeah. <coughs> Kyle, do you want to maybe start talking about the uh, Radiant Black side of things and everyone could talk about where their own guys are at? Yeah, I think that I think that makes sense. When we meet Nathan and Marshall there, um, this is post Radiant Black 24, so they know they have to make this choice. However, um, the choice as to only one of them can be Radiant Black uh, before the start of the Catalyst War. But at this point, there's still a little bit of denial there, particularly on the part of Marshall, um, thinking that they'll they'll figure out a clever solution out of this. And ultimately, even maybe it's a magic solution. Um, and we say that because an offer comes uh, basically to their doorstep by way of Rogue's son, who Ryan can pitch uh, where Rogue's son's at here. Yeah, we when we first started talking about this, I knew that uh, I knew that the volume two was going to be about sort of uh, Dylan sort of stepping into becoming, you know, basically being a solo hero, trying to fill his father's shoes and stuff. But I knew that I wanted to bring in um, like one of the since it's a legacy hero, I wanted to bring in one of the original Rogue Sons. And the idea was that we were like, I was like, well, let's bring the first one and make that a medieval Rogue Son. And when we did that, that started to that started to work into the story about, OK, if we do that. Maybe we can talk about some of the other characters and our legacy characters and get into the and flesh out the world world and the universe of mass diverse a little bit so but it was a really difficult one because i knew at the end of the series at the end of my arc that caleb was going to take over dylan's body and basically become sort of the new rogue son which made it really hard to pitch 
where my character was to people without spoiling the entire thing. Yeah. I think like Matt pointed out during one of my interviews, I'm like, well, you know, Dylan's just a very different person by the end of our run, not realizing that was literal. Um, but that's sort of where it said it. <laughs> it, it provided an interesting thing because it brought us a lot of lore. It brought a, a character that could come in and then bring everybody together um, and yet be connecting both the past, uh, past, past characters and the present characters. Um, so yeah, so coming into it, weirdly enough, Dylan has still not met any of the supermassive people after two crossovers, but hopefully maybe some down, down the line. Nice. Well, um, BB, you know, obviously just missed out on the first supermassive. So like how would freeze over before I let that happen again? And, <laughs> uh, and so for, um, for, for BB, it worked out pretty well that we were planning the end of volume one of the six issue arc, uh, right around the time we were planning the the super massive and so um it actually affected our plot because we were initially planning on on ending dead lucky a little differently and as we started talking about it it just made sense to put bb in a place where um to push up the timeline of her working for morrow and um and ultimately the choice came uh for eddie to die because of super massive because we oh, wow. needed BB to be in a particular place, and um, and it made sense for the story for that to be the reason, uh, and because we knew she had to lose somebody, and um, and it, for Eddie's arc when he felt alone and lost and left behind, and he took control of his own of, of his own narrative and lost his life in that way, it, it made sense for his arc to to end the way it did, but also knowing full well how that would affect BB, it would put her in a place that she needed to be in for Supermassive and also allow us to go into issue seven uh, with her uh, in a different space. And so we're kind of, when we end issue six and we start issue seven, there's a little bit of time. And we were able to time it, um, thanks to Michael and his incredible schedule, that um, when six, we end issue six, Supermassive happens and come back in issue seven. And there's a space where we ha she has not dealt with her grief. And she hasn't really dealt with what it means to lose Eddie. And there's that opportunity there for Supermassive 2023. And so it just ended up working out perfectly for her um, to really just absorb that in a way that she can't with, um, you know, his ex-fiance and, you know, her new on and on, on again, off again girlfriend and mm. all these different baggage that exists in San Francisco. There's now a place that she can actually, you know, be with like-minded people and really think about uh, who she lost and what she would do to get it back. And of course that heartbreaking narrative where she, she, she can't, she just loses people and they don't come back. And um, so it worked out. I guess on the Inferno Go Red side of things, we, because in the first Supermassive, we were seeing a bit of a preview of who Cassia would become. So in relation to everything else, it was kind of a look into the future. We realized that if Cassia were to turn up in this one, that would probably place her even further ahead. And we're all very resistant to creating any sort of confusion in the universe. Um, like we don't want to have like a fast and furious situation where the timeline order is different to the release order and you have to sort of get charts out to explain everything. So we decided pretty early on that it might be better for Cassia to miss out on this one. And it also helped us out in a way, I think, because it helped us set the tone for Supermassives and explain to people that you can't expect to see the same characters in every one. It's going to be a little different every time, especially as the universe expands. It's just going to be whatever's right for the story. It's not going to be the same combinations of things over and over again. Uh, but we did have a space then in the narrative for a new character who could be something of an antagonist potentially initially, but then be brought more into the fold. And we needed to make sure that this character felt like they belonged in all of this and, and had some connections to our universe or our universes even uh, so that they didn't feel like they were just, you know, created for this event. They're an organic part of the universe and also that they felt like they folded in thematically with what everybody else is going through. Uh, it just so happened that because of where all the stories were lining up, this story became about, as Melissa was alluding to, this idea of having to accept taking losses sometimes and dealing with grief and regret 
without it transforming you into something you don't want to become. Um, so we needed this character to sort of be able to fit into that story as well. So I took over the job of creating that character and leading that side of things uh, with Thomas and the new character. Right on. Uh, with the this, with the success of last year's story, was there any additional pressure on uh, making this year's super massive? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, we talked quite a bit about this years and what what genre we wanted to play in and how we want it you know we, there are, there are certain sequels that i won't name but there are certain sequels that we all know that were uh shall we say uh super massively disappointing compared mm -hmm. to the original and we didn't want to be one of those um and at the same time you know we'd created a scenario with the status quo that it, uh, it is challenging to be accessible if you're not really careful in how you introduce everything and everyone. Um, but I could not be more proud of what we, you know, have put together with this one. So it just came about a little, it took a little longer to crack at the start. Um, it took a few calls before we, we landed on what would make sense and the vehicle to do it all through. Yeah, I mean, it definitely stepped up and it lived up the expectation, and especially with Tomasin coming in and making an instant impact, uh, handling a rogue son right out the gate, um, which, uh, sorry, Ryan. <laughs> it was a really, really good fight that you didn't see. Like, it was so <laughs> close. Like, it could have gone either way, honestly. Yeah, I, yeah that was a big thing, because like I say, Tomasin comes in there, and and by the time we see the fight, so I mean, I believe you, there's got to be a, a pre Epic, yeah. 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 Kind of we should do there. a special one shot that's just the rest of that fight so that people can see <laughs> just how like super massive uh, 2023 zero yeah love it. Ooh, it's like so a deadpool numbers. 2 moment where like he comes back and he like wins the fight <laughs> yeah well that'd be amazing <laughs> and and just seeing the the newest addition into the, the massiverse and where the story goes and the, and the story is so well done too and especially where it fits right now, the end of a lot of arcs for the series now, and it's almost like a phase two next wave, because with everything coming out, and especially with everything that you have for each book coming out and following this with the Catalyst War and the new stack quotes for Dead Lucky and Rogue Sun, I mean, this was kind of like, almost like hitting the reset button, and then here we go into what we have lined up. Yeah, I think uh, like it's impossible to deny the influence of the Marvel Cinematic Universe in 2023, right? Mm -hmm. And I think in a, in some ways, like these are kind of like Avengers movies, right? Like this is let's see where everyone's at, let's throw them all together, and then let's throw them out of this back into their own stuff, and let them get up to their own crazy adventures on their own. Absolutely. And speaking of those crazy adventures, we know that coming out of this obviously is a few big events, but I think the one that a lot of fans are really hyped up about right now is the Catalyst War, especially coming out of the big boat that's coming out. And we can Kyle, can you talk a little bit about what we should be expecting with that? Um, a surprising good time. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Kyle, but the thing is, it's such a bad time for some of these people. <laughs> it's going to be. I think the, the readers will have a good time. Some of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, boy. It's been really fun to watch the vote in basically real time. Michael built the mechanism uh, on the site so that we can see it as it's been happening for the last couple of weeks. We have. Um, as we're recording this, we have uh, eight days left, I believe, uh, on the vote. So it'll be over uh, on, uh, well, a week from tomorrow. Um, but uh, that is just basically the setup to what is the most narratively ambitious uh, story I've ever, uh, ever tried to tell. So, um, we're going 
<laughs> Ryan shaking his head. But you, Ryan, you know all the moves, so I I do, and I I I'm terrified for for you and everyone else because I don't <laughs> want to oversell it, but I also don't want to lie to people. So it's a really hard it's a hard balancing act. <laughs> Yeah, it's a it's a it's a big story. Um, and I would also recommend that everyone who has plans to be at San Diego Comic Con that is listening to this definitely be on the lookout for our Massiverse panel, um, which will be the actually issue 25 comes out the the um the Wednesday of San Diego comic-con, and then we'll have a panel in there. Um, you know, we don't know the date yet, but we're going to have a lot to talk about at the panel in San Diego. Oh, very nice. I wish I could get out there for it. So is there any chance it'll be streaming or just got to kind of go off our favorite news sites for that one? Um, I don't know that it'll, it'll be streaming. I'm looking into potentially, um, I don't know if they'll let me, but potentially recording it, um, maybe putting it out through our black market newsletter um okay. but um if not we'll do our best to like tweet and share all of the news that comes out yeah right. there there should be some good news that comes out of it um and uh as far as the event it, the event itself yeah we're this is a um not only are we going to learn quite a bit of mythology about the Radiance and Catalyst, uh, the Machine Empire and what they are and who leads them and where they come from, but also like what their deal is. Um, this is a story that is also designed to fundamentally challenge Radiant Black. And the vote that everyone is partaking in right now is to determine which radiant black catalyst is going to fundamentally challenge. Ooh. Ooh. Oh, and wow. from there, um, I can't say anything else. Okay. <laughs> but, Guys, but I, they, there's stuff favorite... in here that Kyle pitch and I tried to talk him out of it. It's but... yeah. yeah. My so favorite have, thing have... is to go back and listen to this interview after you've read it. And that'll be even more fun. And Kyle knows what I mean by that. But like, there's just like, just come back and listen to what he said after you've read it. And, you know, it'll be great. Well, the question is, Kyle, have you wrote, have you written both storylines just in case? Or, so whatever happens, happens. I, yeah, I we're, we're prepared for, part. we're prepared for yeah. both outcomes of the vote. Now, are we ready for like a Jason Todd, you know, skin your teeth kind of, you know, vote or... Well, that has been interesting. Um, Michael, you can talk about the data a little bit. Yeah, it's been, no one has ever had more than like 58, 60% of the vote at any point. It's wow. like, at the moment, someone's in the lead, but it is certainly not a landslide. And yeah. uh, with a week left to go, like a strong surge of votes in one direction could still swing it either way. I, no, I, I can definitely see that because I it goes back and forth every day I see on social media, hashtag let Marshall cook. And <laughs> like that thing is now taken on storm. And it, it it's and then it always gets responded with, you know, hashtag team Nathan. I mean, it, it goes to show I mean how much these characters could have connected. I mean, the closest con relationship I could say with that is like Hal Jordan and Kyle Rayner way back in the day with Green Lantern, that you have two characters that are different but have both won over the fan base so much that this was i remember reading the issue and i'm going like how the heck do you choose i mean for me it took me a couple seconds because I'm, I'm a big team nathan guy so that it really didn't waste a lot of time for me but like for a lot of fans i could definitely see it going back and forth it it's been pretty um it's been it's been very humbling and and um fulfilling and surprising um seeing how many people writing like these very passionate uh pieces on which character should be radiant black um it's it's cool i'm i'm glad i mean look that was the goal um this is an idea that we've been building towards for 2 years now and from the get go i mean that was always you know when when ryan and i both 
when we talked about early days of Rogue Sun and early days of Radiant Black, like there was a football game that we were at. And I remember sitting in the bleachers, telling, just kind of like broadly pitching, like, well, a year one model and then like a year two model could be this. And then like, well, that leads into like a year three type event. And just to be now doing it um, is very fulfilling. Um, yeah, I lost my train of thought a little bit, but that beard of his is going to be white in a year. It's going to look just <laughs> like this. I'm telling you, it's coming. Enjoy it while it lasts, my friend. No, it's just cool to see. It's cool to see people. That that's all I was trying to say is that we knew when we decided very early on that this would be something that I wanted to build to. Um, it meant really you need to really make sure that you're doing a good job with each character mm -hmm. and making both Nathan and Marshall someone that you can root for um, or see being radiant black because I, I wanted this choice to be really hard for people. Definitely lived up to that too. And then going to the next massive verse book that solicitations are saying that it's coming out June 7th. Has that changed for the dead lucky number seven? It has. Hold on. I've got dates. Uh, it'll okay. be July 5th now. Okay. So yeah, July's my birthday. And I was like, Michael, I absolutely refuse to write this script. And if it doesn't come out any other month, that's exactly <laughs> the reason. Not at all, because I just was super slow and uh, and very overwhelmed. That no, it's the birthday time. thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, Melissa, can you talk about what we should be expecting now with BB post the Battle of San Francisco and obviously in the new stack quo working for Morrow? Uh, yeah. Um, I think you should expect everything. I think. Um, I think there's there's a realm of expectation that you know that we very justifiably set up that she's going to go in and uh, take out Moro and blow it up from the inside, but I think um, the question then becomes you know after um, after a few months and Moro has had taken hold of of San Francisco is whether or not people really want her to, uh, mm -hmm. and um, and a lot of it is going to be um, really focusing, finally um, focusing on on BB herself and the origins of her powers and um, and what they are, especially with, um, I don't know if uh, people caught it in issue six, that when Eddie died, she didn't see him. And so um, she's going to be doing a lot of uh, inner exploration as to uh, why she can't see Eddie uh, when she can see other people. And um, and it's a different BB that you see uh, in one through six because she's back in her element. She is the director of special crimes for Morrow. And that means she's doing a lot of really cool, fun stuff with flashy toys. And when you're on special missions like that, it's very easy to ignore your inner trauma because you have a bigger purpose. And, um, and so it's a lot of it, uh, her being forced to confront things that she necessarily didn't want to. Um, but I'm really excited about this arc. I think uh, you're um, going to see Georgia step up quite a bit, uh, who, is, okay. who had a minimal part. Uh, but now that Eddie is gone, um, you see the, the brand of the PR perspective of Moro in a different way, which is a lot of fun. Uh, Maria has a little bit of a different role. Um, you see a lot of the, the, the one, the, the, Salvation Gang people that you um, we saw glimpses of like Winston and um, and some of the Salvation Pe Gang people that were with her at the end of issue six. You see them a little bit more. So it's a lot of it's, a, it's establishing a new status quo in a really fun way that takes us into, I hope, a really satisfying arc for BB. Can't wait to check that out. Ryan, so obviously another stat quo, uh, another rogue son. I want to say, is this now the third one in 12 issues? Because we had Marcus, we had Dylan, and now Caleb. What can we be expecting now coming out of the new uh, switch up? Um, well, during that conversation, I realized that, that Melissa, you, uh, we should have a rogue son dead lucky team up annual to call We See Dead People. We should just totally be doing that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm half kidding. Well, we'll see. Uh, but <laughs> but um, with Joel Osment. Yeah, exactly. It'll just make a camp. He'll do it. He'll do the audiobook version. Um, yeah. but... I've actually pitched uh, uh, Maria going over to New Orleans and changing jobs and being like another one that sees ghosts. What the hell? <laughs> hey, man, everybody in that town sees ghosts. Um, 
but yeah, coming out of uh, Rogue Sun, yeah, we obviously have big a big shift in the status quo. Um, but it's the same kind of st- like it's the same if you go back to the beginning, right? It's still somebody in the in the Rogue Sun suit, but has like you know. So Dylan was in the Rogue Sun suit, and he had a dad who he hated standing over his shoulder. Now he gets to be the guy standing over the shoulder and kind of be- using his banter and annoyance to plague um, a 17th century knight in present day. Um, but, uh, yeah, coming out, it'll be a new status quo with that. Um, we'll, the new arc will probably dig into, um, some other rogue sons. I don't think it's just going to be just one. I'd like to get a little more into the legacy of all that care of where that, how long that's been around and the different people who've worn it and how that, how they've been heroes and maybe not heroes. Um, and then, um, what else, uh, we'll deal with, um, the first, the first arc was about a was a metaphor for a messy divorce, and the second one was about um, step parents, and the third one this this arc, uh, which we're calling Night Sun, right? That's what we're calling it right now. We'll just call yep. it that. Yeah, it is now. Um, <laughs> well, it, this one's more about family, both the family that uh, I mean, everybody thinks about family, but the family that you're born with and the family that you make along the way. So. Nice. Can't wait to see that. And Matt, I, I'm sure you get asked this a million times, but we got to ask you, what is next for Cassie Acosta? Well, uh, for the market, the next thing is that the trade of book one will be hitting shelves in just a couple of weeks. It looks amazing. Look at so that if you haven't read product Photo, drop. Look at that. that. Expert yeah. marketer. Yeah. Not, not sure. uh, yeah. So if you, if you haven't read Photo Red yet, absolutely grab that. Check it out. Uh, as for what's next for Cassia, more soon uh, we have exciting plans, but nothing that I can say right this second, unfortunately, other than uh, Erica and Igor and I and Kyle and Michael and myself have, uh, we've we've been talking, we've been talking um, and we're excited. Nice. I, I think I get DM'd uh probably the most about Inferno Girl Red and when she is coming back uh, on the show. Like we get hit up so much about that. So I know the fans are definitely excited for it. And if you have not picked it up yet, if go out and get the single issues right now and then obviously get the trade paperback when it drops because it is definitely going to be worthwhile picking up. Thank you. Rich, I know you had a question about sequels. No, I thought that Tom was going to take that one. Oh, oh no, Tom's <laughs> just reading his notes. Oh. You're, we're going into like my notes now. All right, awesome. Uh, will there be a super uh, massive three, or should I say, twenty twenty four? I mean, if the story's there, right? Or if there's a twenty twenty four. We can we talk. see anything spawn from that? From what we just saw, possibly. I mean, all sorts of things can spawn from the story that we just told. Some of them might even be spawn. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe. Well, maybe there's there's some thoughts. We have some there's thoughts. potential. There's potential for everywhere. You're, the the huge sandbox you guys are writing is just amazing. So trust me, it's there. Oh yeah, I mean, I I think now with the success of the two issues, now I well, let's see what. Are- Let's see what this one sells first, and then we'll <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll talk. <laughs> Fair enough, but I, I just know going off the online success, I just with everybody raving about this, that the fans are definitely clamoring for that. And I mean, the possibilities are endless. What you guys can do with this? Oh, thank you. No, it is um, it is very creatively fulfilling um, to work with everyone on these, and you know, they're now they've now become. Uh, fun little problems to crack uh, so far for the last two years, at least once a year uh, where we're it's like, how do we do a new one and how do we do it in a contained way that's still pushing our narratives of our main books forward, but is also, you know, contained and standalone enough for new readers. And um, how do we not repeat ourselves from the, the one before? So those are all the factors that go into um, what another one would look like if we did it. And, uh, but yeah, personally, I would love to do another one. That's, that's where my vote is, is lying. Um, It's a, it's, I think it's a fun format. And I think 
in the way that we have built the books to stand alone um, and be accessible in their own ways uh, that way. Um, this is a really fun kind of feature that uh, we've built into kind of like the publishing DNA to allow us to have those kind of crossover adventures, um, but just in a very kind of, you know, planned way. <clears throat> yeah, because I I think that's just it's such another you know feather in the cap for what you what you do with the massiverse is just when you see these crossovers it it feels like an event it's like it doesn't feel like an issue I mean I might sound cliche to say but it's like when we finally see because there's not a team book out in the massiverse but when you see these characters get together we know it's something special we know it's going to be something memorable and obviously with this issue and this, especially with a few of the surprises that are in. And I don't want to spoil them because I'm stressing to everybody, if you haven't gone to your local comic shop to go buy this, you need to go immediately after you hear this episode or watch this episode and buy two copies. Literally, you're going to, you're going to need to do this. But with that said, it's just now you have so many fans that are asking for different team-ups and different mix-ups. Is there any chance that you would ever mix up and do maybe one based on all the bad guys, per se? Sure. There's yeah. a story. Like, yeah i think the, the goal for us is always that like it has to come out of a story that we're excited about so if someone came up with something and was like i think if this person met this person met this person here's something cool and we all go yep then yeah maybe oh, yeah, i think want to like where because of the flexibility afforded to us by image and and doing things in this way, we're always very open to and looking for different ways of combining things and telling stories and, and new formats to give people these experiences in different ways. So, uh, yeah, I think like we always want to be surprising people. And, and that comes down to the next time you get a hit of something in this sort of way, maybe it's not like the way you got it last time. So, yeah, I mean, I think, um, when we talked at uh, C2E2, we were talking about um, ways to expand the universe into interesting ways. And I remember Kyle was super generous and let me shift, who is very much a villain in Radiant Black. But when he was in The Dead Lucky, he was actually an ally for BB and more of a, because um, she had no content, con concept of what he was doing in Chicago, which she just knew what he was there to do for her. Right. And I think that's what's really interesting about these characters and even about the villains is that, you know, the nuance to them allows them to be played with different ways. Like, you know, I I don't think BB, aside from being mad that he walked out on her, I don't think BB <laughs> sees Shift as necessarily like a villain. I think she sees him as a mercenary and a tool to be used when she needs him. And so um, so even like a story with all villains, like who's to say one of them isn't actually <laughs> going to be a hero by the end of it? depending on what they're going for and what they're doing. And I think that's what's really fun about it. Absolutely. With con seasons coming up, uh, we you already mentioned about San Diego. Is there any other ones that everybody will be attending? And is New York Comic Con on that list? Um, I Kyle, we're both going to be at Boston, correct? We are. We're both going to be at Boston. I'll be at San Diego and Raleigh and Beer City Comic Con. If I you make, go to Miami, where's Beer no. City? Is that the I, real name of the city? If I make it out of Beer City alive and sober, <laughs> I will then <laughs> New York. Uh, yes. Kyle and also doing um, Chicago at the uh, Library Association conference. Yeah. At the end. We're meeting with the librarians. Nice. My heroes. Mm -hmm. I um, it's our hope for Erica. Igor and myself to all be at New York Comic Con this year. Um, I don't know if that's going to happen for me personally. I'm trying to to make that happen, but I will say it's my intention. Um, I've never been to the city of New York in my life, so that would that'd be a cool thing for me to do. Uh, and I'd love to see people there. So he's hoping. I am also hoping to be there on account of it sounds like everybody else in comics is going to be there, and I would like to meet them. Yeah, I kind of feel like I have to go now, even though I have absolutely nothing to do there. I'm just going to show up and be like the person no one invited. 
and like, um miss I, i'm not sure if you know you write a creator and comic series at image comics called the dead lucky it's uh yeah. quite good and popular i'm sure people would love to see you yeah, missy i'll invite you to new york comic con there you go now you've been invited thank you <laughs> oh wait is that how it works it's like it's a vampire <laughs> yeah it's like a vampire yeah <laughs> I mean, you guys Matt, should invite you tell me. them. You could tell them no, the sorry. oversized guy with the beard invited you. <laughs> oh, that'll narrow it down. I, I, I'll, I'll invite him. They can just come to me. I'll just be like, oh, yeah, they're all invited. Absolutely. <laughs> Set them up. So before we let you go, uh, we have to ask, you know, kind of a little non comic question, but since Supermassive 2023 is a sequel to Supermassive 2022, what is everybody's favorite sequel of all time? Oh. Wow. Can I? Oh, okay, wow. I, I'm gonna I'm gonna start, and I'm gonna cheat. <laughs> okay. Based based on what I am hearing about across the Spider Verse this week, yeah, uh, yes. it's it sounds like it's it will be my favorite sequel. Yeah, a lot of good buzz about that one coming out. Yeah, Oppenheimer 2 is going to be fantastic. Like the really just amazing <laughs> film. You know, I've always I've said Baz Luhrmann should make Elvis 2. Like I know <laughs> Elvis died, but most movies are pretend. So just make up stuff that happened next. I, I'm going to go video game. Um I, although technically this is a trilogy, but um Red Dead Redemption. Yep. Ooh. Uh, excellent choice. Well, I'm going to uh, jump on that bandwagon and choose a video game as well then and say Mass Effect 2. Okay. okay. Good one. No pressure, Ryan. You're bringing Better up. than mine, damn it. Oh, I, I actually have to come up with one. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> oh, man, my favorite sequel of all time. Return to Oz. <laughs> the freaking wheelers on that movie scared me for years and the moment they go in and try to have to steal the um when dorothy has to steal the vial off of the the headless witches like in her bedroom in the middle Bobby, of that yeah. and with all the heads staring at her like that's a terrifying movie if you have not seen return to oz i highly recommend it, it it'll change the way you look at wizard of oz Pure nightmare fuel. I will say that. And also on top of that, it proves my point that all of us who are, uh, you know, at least elder millennials and older, mm -hmm. we grew up on kids movies that were made to terrify everybody. And I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with Giver, Dark Hero. Ooh. Uh, ooh. <laughs> ooh. <laughs> it takes me back to early 90s sci-fi channel when they actually spelled sci-fi. Yeah. Solid Snake, Solid Snake is Giver. Um, you know, that, that this is a tough one. Um, I, oh man, <clears throat> pitch perfect too. <laughs> no, okay, go with that. Oh, sure. oh, I have a film, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3, the best no, film, Matt. Matt, best, you made me, Matt, Matt, you made me watch this. This is the one where they, this is the one where they go back to Japan, right? Awful, yeah, Matt. that's right. You're talking about yeah. the best film. Matt is bad. It's bad. It's the Matt. Best. The best. Matt, do you I remember that the... Matt it got Oscar snubbed and I've never never gotten it. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, do you remember that there's a part in it that's a reference to a cross media promotion that they didn't do, but they kept it in the movie anyway? I did, yeah. Yeah, I'm a yeah. big fan of all of that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So I think what I I would probably probably have to go with uh, I just saw it at an academy screening the other night uh, again, but uh, the Dark Knight, like I hadn't seen it in, like yeah. five or six years, and man, it's it's pretty strong. And you know what's good crazy about it too is I went through a period. I, I watched it the last time I saw it. I remember feeling what I had heard, you know, in years since it came out. People talk about about it being like a kind of a product of its uh bush era kind of uh time um but watching it again and i felt that the, you know whenever i last saw it but watching it again now it felt incredibly timely again with so much of what's going on in the world in uh, different ways um and talking about perception and and creating myth and and uh media and and just yeah, yeah, it's uh, it, it's it's a strong one. 
I do hear Jonah Nolan's a fan of Rogue Son. If only there was proof of this. Oh, yeah. If there was, we definitely put it on the front cover of some sort of comic book. Yes, he would. Yeah. Well, before Ken wraps it up and asks the final question, I would, I have to, I would kick uh, Padawan Jay, who usually is on the ODPH podcast, uh, I'm filling in for, he would really like kick me in the ass if I did not ask Ryan. You know, Ken's a diehard Buffalo Bills Man, fan. Man, you had to go oh, there. You're oh, my you Dolphins had to fan. go there. Can, can, can you tell him what he should expect this year from the Miami Dolphins? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't Can know, man. From them, it's a, ooh, all right. I was gonna be nice, but now it's gonna be exactly what happened during <laughs> week three last year. Oh, Come on see, down I, to Miami, where it's nice and warm. See, I was waiting for you to say your favorite sequel is the Bills losing four Super Bowls. Like, wow. I, was waiting on that I don't even need to be here. <laughs> see, I was waiting on it because I was like, okay, if we're gonna start talking football, I was, I was holding back because you. you you know what's going to happen when we start talking football. Well, I understand this, but I know Pad would be bad at me if I didn't. Ask him. He's no. a Patriots fan too. I know. Oh, well, no, yeah, he, he, yeah he, I know. That's why I try telling him. Like, yeah, you know, he should just jump ship. Brady's gone. Nobody, you know, look for you know any wiser to him. Nope. He's still look, sitting there trying to stir the pot. Here's the best I comment I can give the, the jump off ship. <laughs> I'm going to say this. The best comment I can give you is, as a Dolphins fan, I can admit that Josh Allen is amazing. So that's the best thing I can say. I appreciate. Is it. he a dolphin? No, he's plays for the Bills. He's really, really good. Okay. Yeah, but like I say, with, between I think, I, yeah, because I we can go on that full football rant between Buffalo and Miami. I think we're going to both have good seasons. If two is back a hundred percent, that season last year is a whole different ball of wax. And I'm yeah. not even worried about Aaron Rodgers with the Jets. That's that's an afterthought. Wait, Buffalo don't have bills. They're like cows. <laughs> <laughs> Ducks I have do, bills. I, I do have a serious question have about Eagles, this. But we have that team. Uh, is the killer in Tyler to the Labs I mean, named the after the people. football team? <laughs> Maybe. Bill. Okay. Yeah, it's the singular version. Weed, weed country. <laughs> yeah. well, American football is, a, is, is, is an interesting experience. especially. Hey, in- I've learned, uh, speaking of weird country, I've learned all about, I'm, I'm a happy little Vegemite, so don't tell me about weird country. <laughs> oh, no. I don't like it when you have ammunition to return fire. <laughs> oh, man. Hey, you never know where you get sports teams here. Listen, there's no lakes in L.A., but they have the L.A. Lakers. <laughs> That's a fantastic point. I like the one that oh, there's no uh, – YouTube. Didn't... Minnesota. Hold on, they yeah. started in Minnesota. That's well, yeah, the Minnesota. Yeah, yeah, right. The yeah, yeah, but, but they didn't the move jazz the moved to Utah where they <laughs> don't allow music, so yeah, like yeah. it makes no sense. Yeah, music leads to handholding. <laughs> leads to yeah. Wow. <laughs> well, we're not going to go any deeper than that, or else no. I have to get Diesel out of here. For this. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we're, we're not behind a Patreon wall, so. But we'll just kind of wrap things up. Super massive 2023 is in stores. Final pitch. If somebody's listening to this for the first time, somebody is watching this on nerd initiative for the first time hearing about this book why should they go out in your words to go get this book if you love fun optimistic superhero stories with a ton of heart and all the funny like into the spider-verse and presumably the upcoming greatest sequel ever across the Mm spider-verse then supermassive 2022 and 2023, this year's are very much for you. Absolutely, can't stress That's my it sales enough. Bit. If you don't have this book in your collection, and note, I have two because it's that damn good. You need to run out and you need to go pick it up at your local comic shops, along with Inferno Go Red, along with Rogue Sun, The Dead Lucky, Radiant Pink, which is out. The finale is there this week too, so we definitely want to plug that. It, it, is Matchel shipping now after that issue? I mean, I ship it. I I, I can only hope other people do as well. I saw a I couple love posts online. I love more of it. Yeah. Did you just call it did you just call it Matchel? I saw it, yeah. He coined it. That's a thing now. Yeah, I've been seeing that pickup scene. Wouldn't online. it be Mashi? Wouldn't that be better? I mean, oh, it could be. <laughs> we need a vote. Yeah, we need another ahead. vote. You know, already you know, all right, I'll build the website. <laughs> uh, also, last thing, uh, a shout out to Daniele DiNicolo and Walter Beamonte and Becca yes. Carey 
who yes. drew, colored, and lettered this 50-page behemoth. And uh, uh, God, it, it was so awesome to work with uh, Danielle and Walter again. And um, I think they delivered something that is visually unlike any other superhero book on the stands right now. Absolutely. Like I said, you need to pick up all these books. Radiant Black, if you haven't voted yet, make sure you go make the vote happen. Team Nathan, Team Marshall, so whatever you're choosing. And you also want to make right. sure you're picking up no one as well. And the podcast too. There's so much amazing things coming out from the Black Market Narrative team. If you're a comic book fan, you need to have it in your collection. You need to make it a monthly, weekly thing. I'm telling you, if you're not if you're not picking it up, you're completely missing out. So that said, I want to thank my panel that joined us here as well. Rich from 3FN. Thank you so much for having me. Tom from Off the Cuff with Tom. Ken, always a pleasure. Thank you so much. It'll be excellent to each other. And of course, thank you to our guests, Matt Groom, Michael Basiddle, Melissa Flores, Ryan Parrott, and Kyle Higgins. Thank you for checking out this special edition of the ODPH podcast, better known as the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. Go by Supermassive. We'll see you next time. Clear. And we're done. Awesome. <laughs> thank awesome. you awesome so much. That's great. Oh. Thanks, guys. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Your reviews are always so much fun to read. So well, thank, thank you, you so, so much. Man. I appreciate hearing that. Mm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Matt, both the sports team and the serial killer are named after Buffalo Bill, a figure from the American <laughs> Old West. Oh, right. And it makes sense. I mean, the the Bills Mafia is is a unique group, so uh, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Also, if you've oh. ever been to the city of Buffalo, you'd understand. Yeah, I have. Just, I haven't. Bring a <laughs> have ton not. of yeah. Bring a ton of ketchup and mustard when you go. <laughs> they'll know that, they'll know that right now. <laughs> all right awesome. well thank you again and when the books come out uh i'd love to talk to everybody individually when it comes out as well so. awesome absolutely. absolutely with that question thanks guys awesome right, thank, thank you, you. Thanks, thank yeah, you. Take care. good seeing you again <laughs>